Welcome to the Global War Watch Network. Today, we're taking a look at a true icon of the Cold War skies. It's an aircraft that not only outlived the nation that built it, but is still fighting on today's battlefields, the Mikoyan MiG-29, or as NATO calls it, the Fulcrum. Hey, before we jump in, if you enjoy these deep dives into legendary military hardware, do us a favor and hit that subscribe button. We put out new explainers every single week, and you are not going to want to miss what we have coming up next. You know, for this one, we're going to push aside all the politics, all the grand strategy. Today is all about the machine itself, a fighter jet that was engineered for one single brutal purpose, achieving raw air dominance. All right, so to really get the fulcrum, you have to go back to where it all started, the incredibly high-stakes arms race of the Cold War. Let's look at the threat that basically forced this airplane into existence. So picture this. The Soviet Union is watching the United States FX program, and they are getting nervous. The result of that program, the F-15 Eagle, was a massive technological leap. You combine that with the nimble little F-16, and suddenly America was on the brink of owning the skies. A response wasn't just an option, it was an absolute strategic imperative. So, in 1969, the Soviets hit back. They launched the Advanced Frontline Fighter Program, or PFI, and the demands were intense. They needed a fighter that was not only fast and agile, but also tough enough to operate from rough, barely prepared airstrips. And get this, this one program would give birth to two legends, the big, powerful Su-27 flanker and its scrappy, more nimble counterpart, the MiG-29 Fulcrum. Okay, so this stage was set, but what exactly did the Mikoyan Design Bureau cook up? Let's get under the hood and take a look at the anatomy of the fulcrum to see what made this thing so darn formidable. The design philosophy behind the MiG-29 was crystal clear. Win the dogfight. We're talking close-range visual combat. It was engineered for mind-bending agility with an incredible turn rate and the ability to fly at super high angles of attack. In a turning fight, this thing was designed to be an absolute nightmare. First off, it was blazingly fast. It could hit Mach 2.3, which is over 2,400 kilometers per hour. It could also rocket up to its service ceiling of 18,000 meters, or about 59,000 feet, getting it into the fight in a hurry. And this, this is the number that really matters for a dogfighter. It was built to handle maneuvers pulling up to nine Gs. That means it could practically turn on a dime, trying to get on an opponent's tail. Now, this is where it all comes together. It's got two powerful Klimov RD-33 engines, but they're spaced far apart. That space between them actually creates a lifting surface. You combine that with a blended wing body, where the wings and the fuselage just flow into each other, and you get amazing aerodynamics. The Shell 30UM helmet-mounted sight? That was a total game-changer. The pilot could target an enemy plane just by looking at it, even way off to the side. And for that rough fields capability, it has these cool auxiliary air inlets on top, so it could close its main intakes on dusty runways to protect the engines. And it all else failed, it had that big, punchy GSH-31 cannon. So the design looks fantastic on paper, right? But the real question is, how did it actually do when things got real? Let's take a look at the Fulcrum's combat record. The MiG-29 has seen action all over the globe. Its first taste of combat was actually with the Iraqi Air Force in the Iran-Iraq War, but its most famous conflicts were often against forces that were, frankly, better equipped and better supported. In the 1991 Gulf War, Iraqi MiGs were just overwhelmed. During the Kosovo War, Yugoslavian MiGs fought hard but were seriously outmatched. And today, it's being used heavily by both Russia and Ukraine in the biggest war in Europe in generations. And this slide, right here, this really gets to the core of the MiG-29 story. It's this gap between what the plane could do and what it actually did in combat. See, many of the export versions were what they called monkey models. They had less capable radars and avionics. You combine that with pilots who didn't have enough training, and then you throw them up against forces with better support, like AWACS planes, and you get a situation where the fulcrum was often fighting with one hand tied behind its back. The combat record just doesn't tell the full story. Now, the collapse of the Soviet Union could have easily been the end of the road for the MiG-29, but instead, it was actually the beginning of a whole new chapter. With the Russian military suddenly facing huge budget cuts, the Mikoyan Design Bureau had to find a way to survive. So they turned to the export market to keep the lights on. At the same time, all these other countries that already flew the MiG-29 wanted to modernize their fleets. This led to a whole series of upgrade programs that would completely transform this aging Cold War warrior. 
And what's an evolution it has been? I mean, just look at this. The original MiG-29 was a pure air-to-air -air fighter with a cockpit full of old-school analog dials. The modern MiG-29 SMT, though, is a true multi-role jet. It's got a glass cockpit with big LCD screens, a much more powerful Zook M radar, and that distinctive humpback spine that holds a ton of extra fuel and gives it way more range. But maybe the biggest change is that it can now carry a whole suite of precision-guided air-to-ground weapons, turning it from just a dogfighter into a versatile strike aircraft. And this all brings us to today, where this legacy Cold War platform is showing some pretty surprising relevance on the 21st century battlefield. You might think that a fighter designed in the 1970s would be totally obsolete in an age of stealth jets and network-centric warfare, but the MiG-29's tough, adaptable airframe has turned out to be its greatest strength, allowing for some really creative and effective modernizations. And the most incredible example of this, hands down, is what's happening in Ukraine. Technicians there have figured out how to integrate American-made harm anti-radiation missiles onto their Soviet-era MiGs. I mean, just think about that. It's a stunning feat of battlefield engineering. And elsewhere, India has upgraded its fleet to the advanced UPG standard, and countries like Serbia and Belarus have done deep modernizations to keep their fulcrums flying and fighting for years to come. Ultimately, the story of the MiG-29 really shows us that sometimes adaptability can be just as valuable as having the latest cutting-edge tech. And it leaves us with a really fascinating question for the future of air combat. Can these upgraded, older fighters continue to hold their own in skies that are increasingly filled with fifth-generation stealth jets? And that's our look at the incredible story of the MiG-29 Fulcrum. Thank you so much for joining us. If you found this explainer valuable, the absolute best way to support what we do is to hit that like button, share this with someone who might find it interesting, and of course, subscribe for more from the Global War Watch Network. So now I want to hear from you. What do you think is the most important part of the Fulcrum's legacy? Is it that raw, dogfighting potential it was born with? Its complicated and often misunderstood combat record? Or its incredible modern-day adaptability? Let us know what you think down in the comments below. You can also find links to all our social media in the description. We'll see you on the next one.